You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Jeff Lindsay back on the show with me today to talk about his brand new Riley Wolf uh, thriller. It's called Fool Me Twice. And I'll tell you what, Jeff, this th- this was one of the most fun books that I've read this year. And I'll tell you what, if there's ever been a year where we're looking forward to fun books. This is it. Uh, welcome yeah, back to the show. I find one too. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I run on the, uh, run up on any, I'll send it to you. Well, it's unfortunate I read this one. And, uh, yeah. so. That's what I hear. That's what I hear. And you you probably read it more times than uh, than than you're comfortable with at this point. It gets old after the fiftieth or sixtieth time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Jeff. Um, you know this. This has been a weird year, and uh, it, 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 it's a. Uh, it's kind of funny when when you you talk to writers because uh, you know writers tend to spend uh, a lot of time alone and quarantined, if you will. Uh, you know, with just them and their computer or notebook or whatever the device is. Um, what has this year been like for you? And I, I understand because we know how publishing works. Fool Me Twice has probably been off your desk uh, for quite a while now. Yeah. But uh, but what has this year been like for you and for your creative process? Well, you know, when you say it's funny, um, nah, it's going to be funny in 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> um, right now, it's been really hard. The first couple of months, it was like, you know, nothing much has changed. As you say, I spend most of my time alone in a room um, sitting at my desk. but couple of months in, um, all of a sudden I wanted to go to a bar and have a beer. Mm. Uh, I don't usually go to bars and have beers, but the fact that I couldn't made me right. want to do it a lot. So <laughs> right. it, it got hard. It, it still is. I find it very hard to concentrate and do my work every day. Just there's just it's not even distractions. It's we've all been living on the edge of a sword for nine months now. Uh, never knowing when our weight is going to pull us down onto the blade and cut us in half. It's, you know, there are monsters outside the door and they may be inside the house and we don't even know what they look like. And some of them, you know, are on their way and they'll be over for dinner. And you, it's just crazy. It's it's just it, it's impossible to sustain this kind of tension for so long. And yet we do. We have to. What's so funny, Jeff, is I was watching a, a, a Netflix series with my wife uh, last night, and there it was about episode seven in a in a limited series, ten episodes, I think. And all of a sudden, there were characters in the show who all started getting sick and all started having similar symptoms. And and we both looked at each other and said, "Oh God, they're not going to do a COVID storyline, are they?" And and thank God it was food poisoning, and it oh, was good. and it was malicious food poisoning, you know, by a uh, by a a competing restaurant, and and it's so sad that we we were both like, oh great, it's food poisoning. This was something yeah. malicious somebody did. This is not more of this COVID crap. You know, it, it's funny. It reminds me of a story that ha- actually happened to a friend of mine. Um, and I heard he got divorced, and when I finally ran into him, I asked him what happened, and he said. Um, I was mowing the lawn and suddenly I keeled over unconscious <laughs> and I came to and the EMS crew was around me and my family is standing behind them laughing. And it turns out they thought he'd had a heart attack. They called the ambulance and the uh, EMS people said, no, it's food poisoning. <laughs> and that's why they were laughing from relief. But he said, I could never get past that of lying on the ground, not knowing if I was going to live or die and seeing them all laughing at me. <laughs> That's the kind of story I love because it's, it's horrible and funny at the same time. <laughs> well, 
what's what's interesting to me, Jeff, is um, you know we've had lots of conversations with folks about you know what's uh, what is the the state of fiction going to be like after this, and and how many people are at home right now writing pandemic thrillers or or something, you know, and and I don't know about you, but I'm not really interested in reading any pandemic thrillers uh, next year because I lived it this year. Right. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, those books are not going to sell. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm with you on that. But what I do think will be interesting is to see what this does to our collective sense of humor. Um, you know, will 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 there be a, a darker, um, you know, bent to our sense of humor coming out of this? Well, I, I'm going to guess there will be, which is a relief yeah. to me because I've sort of always leaned that way. <laughs> That's kind of your thing. Isn't yeah, it? it's um, it, it seems likely, you know, the only people that that can joke about executions are the people pulling the lever. Right. Um, and we've all been pulling the lever this year. So True. Uh, it, it, I, I'm pretty sure you're right. Yeah. Well, um. Last year, we talked about this new character that you had developed, Riley Wolf. And uh, first off, um, you know, you wrote Dexter for for so many years. And uh, and before that, you you told me that you uh, had written science fiction. Um, What's interesting to me is that, uh, you know, the Dexter series can be in a lot of ways as just diametrically opposed to to what we think of as science fiction. do you find that interesting that, you know, someone who began in science fiction kind of uh, really found his stride writing uh, more grounded, down to earth stories as fantastical as they are with the subject matter? Um, but, you know, the Dexter series is very much rooted in in real right now life. Uh, do you find that interesting at all that you started in one place and really found yourself over here? No, I, I think that, you know. I, I I don't know if it's all writers or just me, but I feel like I should be flexible enough to write in almost any genre. Um, I don't want to pull a Stanley Kubrick and check off the list, you know, okay, I've done a funny, funny one, now I'll do a horror one, all that. But if I get pulled in one direction, I'd like to be able to go that way. Um, I just can't. I, I'm sort of, you know, there's an expectation that what I write is going to be sort of in this general area. It's, you know, it's typecasting. And uh, it it seems like, you know, a little bit crazy to complain about it when I'm being successful at it. Gotcha. Um, When when writing a character like Dexter for as long as you did and becoming so intimately familiar with that character's uh, you know, idiosyncrasies and his character traits and the things that motivate him and, and the things that uh, the, the fears and, and all of those things that encapsulate a character when switching gears to, to Riley Wolf, who is, um, you know, very different from Dexter. Um, how do you begin learning a new character and getting so, so close to someone that, that you've not had time to, to really fill out? Well, I think it all goes back to uh, to acting, you know, and it's, you know, learning a character from the inside out. And that's what I do. I, I come up with what I want the character to be doing. And then I go backwards and think what would make them do it that way. Uh, so it's like reading a script as an actor. Oh, he does this. OK, what would make him if it was me? Why would I do that? And I. I've always taken pride in writing characters that are not just cardboard cutouts. Now, even my minor characters have a life, or that's what I shoot for. Um, so just as an example, developing a new series protagonist, I work with a psychologist and, you know, give them the general outline and we work, you know, what would make that happen? Would this work? No, that's that's not right for the personality and so on. So it's really just, you know, oh, good, I've got a new role to play. And it's, it's not much more complicated than that. You move on. Working with a psychologist, that's an interesting uh, twist for a writer. Uh, one that that sounds perfectly plausible um, when you're dealing with with character traits and things like what sorts of 
what's that relationship with the psychologist like and, and what are you hoping to get from them? Um, what I'm hoping to get from is easy authenticity. The way I work with them depends on which psychologist it is, I guess. Um, for Dexter, it was family members. Uh, this time around, it was a woman I met who was a fan. And I, I don't know, we just, you know, I enjoyed talking to her. And so I asked if she'd be willing to help with this. And, you know, it, it worked out pretty well. And little things like, um, uh, how about this dream sequence? And I'd send her a chapter and she'd read it and write back. Uh, this really isn't authentic uh, for the dream. And the symbolism is wrong and it wouldn't motivate anyone to do this or that and so on. So it would go back and forth. And it's, uh, you know, it, it has to be someone who's not afraid to to tell me the truth about what they're thinking. Uh, that comes from theater, too. We used to have a a thing in my when I had a theater company that everyone has permission to call you an asshole if you are being one. <laughs> and right. you don't you don't worry about hurting feelings because we're dealing with telling the truth here. When when you're dealing with uh, with creating a new character, it, it, you have become the the master of flawed uh, protagonist. And uh, uh, yes, absolutely. And and we love to come to one of your books and uh, maybe see someone a little more messed up than us and <laughs> and then get, get to, you know, have a, a fun romp with this person that we can we can kind of look down our nose at because, uh, you know, well, I'm better than him, um, but I also understand him. Um, do, do you begin with a certain character flaw? Is there, uh, you know, like when you. When you start thinking of a, a Dexter or a Riley, um, are you thinking about certain flaws and then how you can, uh, you know, then manipulate those flaws or, or live it up to the the nth degree? Um, do you begin with the flaw with them? No, no, I think it's I think it's just the opposite. I begin with, you know, what they do, what they're good at, and I take it backwards. You know, the flaws make it more interesting. And again, it's part of developing a character that isn't a cardboard figure, um, a flat Riley. Uh, but um, it's uh, everybody has flaws. And uh, one of the the series I read when I was like 10 years old, an old thing from the, the 30s that my father gave me, um, Doc Savage. I don't know if you've ever even heard sure. of it. Sure. But he had no flaws at all. He was perfect. And it, it gets <laughs> dull after a while. It's like early Batman and Superman. Right. You know, no matter what happens, Batman goes, oh, I'll have to take this from my utility belt. There, that's dealt with. Now what? And mm -hmm. Superman the same way. Um, you know, oh, I'll have to use my heat ray. Okay, now what? And there was no problem they couldn't handle. They had no flaws. They were perfect people and perfect heroes. And, you know, thank God, the, I guess it was the 60s and 70s came. Um, the first comic book I really got hooked on was Spider-Man, because Peter Parker had pimples and couldn't get a date. And it was real. He had flaws. <laughs> he was a geek. <laughs> so, yeah. you, you know, that's, that's the way you create characters that people like. People love the idea of that original Superman or Batman, but it, you couldn't really like the character because... Who were they? I don't know. This perfect thing? It, it, who cares? Well, and when you have a, a Superman or Batman who are physical uh, you know, specimens of perfection, uh, right. then the, the only place to build drama is, uh, you know, in their emotional life uh, or, or in their interpersonal relationships. There, there has to be a crack somewhere, doesn't there? Yeah. And there's... Um... <laughs> It's funny, just a, maybe a tangent. One of the characters in new books I pitched a few years ago was a black ops guy who was retired. And he's like 60 years old. And um, it, like it used to be, you know, five guys come at him and he's James Bond. Ha, 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 all done, all dead. But, um, you know, now he's got all those old injuries slowing him down. And when he stands up, it hurts, and it takes a minute to loosen up. 
Uh, so that that was the idea for the character. He's still got to do those things, but it hurts. It's a lot harder. Uh, that came to me. I was doing martial arts at the time. And, you know, after a long session, you go home, you go to bed, and you wake up the next morning barely able to move. And it occurred to me, you know, if someone, I'm sitting in a bar having a beer, and someone says, you know, this is it, we're going. I'd have to say, okay, give me 10 minutes to stretch, and I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the kind of character I like. You know, overcoming flaws is part of the thing, not just overcoming the main problem. Jackson's battle to take control over his own mind and life portrays what millions of people are fighting with around the world, mental illness. His mother, desperate to free him from his demons and desperation, faces her own turmoil and anguish, doing anything possible to save her son through love and hope. After countless emotional and heartbreaking triumphant moments, June and her son must both accept that only Jackson can save himself. Pick up Jackson by Lynn McLaughlin and discover why people are raving about this book and saying things like, Jackson is symbolic of millions living with some form of mental illness and his mother represents the millions who have their own struggles caring for someone with a mental health issue. Jackson by Lynn McLaughlin. Pick it up today at Amazon.com. Both Barrels Publishing is the brainchild of successful indie author James P. Sumner. He has self-published over 15 titles in the last five years and has over 800,000 downloads so far in his career, meaning he has a wealth of knowledge and experience to share with the indie publishing community. Knowing the struggles of the modern-day indie author as well as he does, he wanted to create a platform that would allow writers of any level to learn the ropes, navigate the pitfalls, and produce a professional novel without wasting time or money in the process. Both Barrels Publishing is the perfect one-stop shop for any indie author, combining James's expertise with his own team of editors and designers so you can help your novel realize its full potential and learn how to publish yourself. The purpose of Both Barrels Publishing is to help indie authors get their novels ready for publication without all the stress, hassle, and unnecessary expense. We want to make your lives easier, which is why we're giving you access to a top-notch team to publish your novels, along with a generous discount on their services. You can also work one-on-one -on -one with James to learn the intricacies of self-publishing. No hidden costs, no false promises. We simply want you to publish the best version of your novel. BothBarrelsPublishing.com When uh, when you start thinking uh, of a new Riley Wolf book, for instance, um, what are what are some of the things that you take into consideration, and and where does the the story begin for you? Uh, is it uh, you know uh, an article that you read, uh, uh, you know a, a news piece that you saw? Is it um, is it a scenario like in this book? Is it the impossible heist? Uh, or, you know, is it uh, some new character flaw about Riley that you want to explore? Um, what is that first kernel of the story like for you? Well, with the first book, Just Watch Me, and the first Riley Wolf book. By the way, that's just out in paperback, so it makes a great Chris Christmas present to get uh, both the paperback of Just Watch Me and the hardcover brand new release of Fool Me Twice. I'm working on my pitching, my plugging skills. I hope that's <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and and both are available in audiobook also. Let's don't forget yes. that. And um, with the first book, I, I was sort of surfing. I was looking for something that would be impossible to steal. And, you know, you go through different things. And I love artworks. I look at those. Some of those are hard to get and so on. And I don't know. I, I finally went to most valuable objects in the world. And that's when I got to... Uh, the Dari Noor diamond. And I thought about that and I thought about, okay, it's really hard to get because it's in Iran. What makes it harder? And I put it, you know, surrounded by the best security in the world and two teams of trained killers. So when I started with Fool Me Twice, I started in the same place, but I thought it has to be harder than that. And that was my challenge this time. And 
you know, if you're being fair, stealing that jewel in Just Watch Me was nearly impossible. Uh, for Fool Me Twice, it's literally impossible because um, he's stealing a fresco and a fresco is literally part of the wall. So you have to steal the wall. Right. And the wall is in the Vatican. So somebody's going to notice. Um, so that, that was the challenge that time. What's what's funny to me when I when I first um, uh, saw the book and and got the arc uh, when I read the description, I, I in my <laughs> mind I'm imagining you um, with a hat and just writing down worst possible scenarios ever and just throwing all these into a hat and you just pulled out ten of them and said I'm going to combine these ten worst case scenarios and oh, and try to find you know a way for Riley to get out of it. Um, That'd make a great parlor game, wouldn't it? <laughs> that would. That would be amazing. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, uh, interesting things going on in this book. And you open the book where Riley is stealing a Fabergé egg. And, um, you know, it, it kind of opens in the best way that James Bond novels opened. Um, drop you right into the action where there's this other thing going on. Uh, you know, Bond works his way out of that. Then you have a bit of respite and then, you know, on to the main uh, action. Uh, <clears throat> it, it, was that uh, uh, kind of uh, a, a conscious thing that you did in the uh, in the beginning of this book to drop us in on the action? And what does that that first situation that we find him in do for the story? Yeah, that, that's conscious. Um and what it, what it really does is it's a springboard. It, it takes you right into the action and into the story. And what I did with this is that it becomes part of the larger plot and not just, you know, like James Bond, he's finishing up the, the last case and then the next one comes up when he goes home. Um, this one, and uh, you know, he, he steals the Fabergé egg and the guy he's hired to help him escape betrays him. And he, uh, he betrays him because the guy who captures Riley and makes him steal the fresco hired him to betray him. So it, you know, it ties together. Um, but I like opening the books that way because it, you know, it propels you into the story quickly and uh, with a little shot of fun. What sort of research did you have to do for this book, Jeff? Because, uh, you know, um these are very specific items in very specific places with very specific um, you know, safeguards in place. Uh, how do you prepare to write uh, scenarios like this? Well, you know, I knew about Fabergé eggs, um, and it was just a matter of picking one that was in a place that I liked. And, you know, the, Riley says he's pissed off at Russia, and so it was easy to get one of the many of them that are in Russia. So um, as to that, then you just do research and can't travel to these places right now, but you can do virtual tours. And um, so, you know, I've been all over the, the Heritage Museum and the Vatican and all of that by virtual tour. Uh, I really hate getting something wrong. So I do as much research as I can. That's the the advent of the Internet and um the ability for authors to to be in multiple places at once um ha has really been a, a boon for uh for writing that yeah, there's, I, there's I never been a time where sometimes. you could do what you could do yeah i i think about that sometimes and think about you know what i had to do with my first couple of books which was basically camp out in the public library for a couple of weeks before right. i got all of that done and then you know oh there is no book on the security in the vatican I'm sorry. And now what do I do? I have to change the story or make it up. But now, yeah, boom, I'm there. And I'm done with the Vatican. I fly to Bangladesh on another virtual tour. I love it. Um, one interesting thing about the the Dexter books is that uh, because they're set in Miami, South Florida, South Florida becomes a bit of a character in that series. and. Right. Um, you know, and you, you, it definitely grows with the, with the story, um, with, with the Riley books, because he is kind of a jet setter and he's all over the world and in, in what he does, you don't get the benefit of place a, as you did in the Dexter series, but how do you feel about 
uh, about that and and not having a home base, as it were, that uh, that the story grows in. Well, I, mean, I don't mind it at all. I mean, I like having Miami as home base for Dexter because uh, it was my home base. Right. But um, for Riley, I, I wanted him to travel around. I wanted him to know more about the world. Uh, he's a totally self-educated guy. And what I found with a lot of those people is, you know, they, they want to know more. They want to go further. and go to all of those places. And so just as an example, you know, you don't hear, well, at the Little Bighorn, uh, Custer found this bluff that he thought would protect him. You know, I want to go stand there and go, yeah, he may have thought that, but that was kind of dumb because look at the heights over there. That right. kind of thing. It's important. Absolutely. Um, an interesting thing happens when you have a long running book series that becomes uh, a very successful television series um, in, in people's minds and readers or viewers. Um, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, a thing that happens where these characters merge and meld and, and, you know, people's ideas about characters become solidified when they see them and hear them and that sort of thing. Um, you, you had plenty of time writing the Dexter series before it became a TV series. Um, and, you know, uh, Riley Wolf now is uh, lives in the books, although I can definitely see this becoming uh, another media property. Uh, Lord willing, one day it will. Um, but uh, does as a writer, does that ever uh, does the other life that the work that you do take on ever affect the writing? No, it's uh, it's always been easy for me to separate. And when I watched Dexter, um, that was one of my favorite TV shows. So I, I turn it on and watch. And when my name came up on the screen, it was always like, Ooh, Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> and you know, you separated after a while. Uh, I, part of that may be because, you know, like I say, I, I worked in Hollywood. Um, I know the game. And so uh, I was already, before they even started shooting, I had already prepared a wall you know, to keep me at a distance and not get emotionally involved because the odds are overwhelming that it's going to be something awful you don't want your name on. It right. didn't turn out that way this time, which never happens, but it happened to me. So I was incredibly lucky, but I was still able to keep my distance emotionally. That that really is such a great point because there have been numerous adaptations that have happened that I'm sure the authors would would prefer to just turn and walk the other way and just pretend yeah, that it never absolutely. happened. That's a very big gamble, isn't it? Yeah. But it's, you know, Ernest Hemingway said, if you're going to deal with Hollywood, um, take your manuscript to the border, throw it over, wait for them to throw money back and then hold it with both hands and run like hell. <laughs> and that's really the best advice. Don't, don't worry about it. You know, it's an extra payday for no more work. That's really the only advice worth taking, isn't it? As a writer, it is. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, your job is done when the when the book is done. And if they want to make a movie out of it, great. Thank you. Please. And honestly, it sells more books, too. So what is there to hate? Right. Exactly. So, Jeff, what what's going on with you right now? I know that Fool Me Twice is out uh, available everywhere today in hardcover and Kindle edition and audiobook. Um, and, uh, you know, this book is, is out into the world now and, and your hands are completely off of it, but, uh, knowing you, uh, and the, the, the busy workman that you are, what are you working on right now? Um, I'm working on the next Riley Wolf book for one thing, and I've got, uh, four plays in various stages of being finished that I've been polishing and working on. And I'm trying to get um, a whole slew of songs down, recorded. Um, I, I, I was just thinking, I have, you know, I've been writing songs for 40 years. And they're not recorded anywhere, except one or two of them I sold. And so I, I want to put them all down, you know, just, I guess I'm thinking legacy. Maybe that means I'm getting old. <laughs> but uh, I, I wanted them recorded. So I'm trying to do that. It's hard to do anything right now. I've probably said that already, but yeah, it's really hard. 
it, it's hard, but but there's something oddly motivating about the like, getting things done right now. There's a there's a, a an interesting push that that everyone's feeling right now. Well, I felt that at first, but after about three months, uh, I think the fretting took over and the anxiety. <laughs> I think you're probably right. Um, Jeff, before we go, um, did I see that Showtime is bringing Dexter back for a, a, an, another series or what, what's yes, going on is. there? Yeah, it's a limited series. This is this is a, a one run and that's it. Um, but, uh, you know, the idea has been out there forever. Ever since the show ended, there's been rumors and, you know, Internet talk about, oh, why don't they bring it back? Oh, God, it was so good. Why did it stop? Yada, yada. So the time has come. Why not? And the original cast is on board. And just as important, the original showrunner is on. So um, I don't have I don't think there are any dates set, but they're in pre-production. It's definitely happening. And, uh, you know, more power to them. Well, that's something to look forward to for the next year. I'll, I'll you tell go. you what. Yeah, that's uh, right now we're looking for good news and, and that is good news. So we'll take that. Good. Yep. <laughs> Jeff, this has been so much fun chatting and, and catching up with you. We're going to send everyone. We're going to send everyone to pick up their copy of Fool Me Twice. There's links to it in the show notes. Um, is there a place online where people can find you if they want to dig into all the amazing stuff that you've got going on? I've got a website at uh, jefflindsaybooks.com, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dexter Jeff. Dexter Jeff. We'll put links there as well. Um, thank you. Jeff, thank you so much for taking time to come back on the show. It was a pleasure, Hank. Always is. Thank you. A hitman with a conscience. Ian Bragg is paid to kill people. Only bad people and not many, but for a great deal of money. Case the target. Make the hit. Move on until he meets the woman with sparkling green eyes who changes everything. A few pre-readers had this to say about Ian Bragg. Mark Dawson, million-selling thriller author, says a rip-roaring ride from start to breathless finish. Craig Martell hit a home run with the operator. The taut, lean prose and lightning-fast pace make this a page-turner without sacrificing an ounce of story or depth. You'll find yourself rooting for the hitman main character as he faces the toughest decision of his career. The Operator is the start of a new thriller series I expect to see burning up bestseller list for years to come, says A.C. Fuller, author of the Crime Beat and Alex Vane media thrillers. Suave, romantic, and lethal, Ian Bragg is everything you want in a highly paid assassin. Can't wait to ride this train, says James Blatch, self-publishing formula. It's been a long time since I fell this hard in love with a book, a very long time. Author of Women of Wine County Romantic Suspense, Terry Wells Brown says, Grab this book from Craig Martell, The Operator. Bone Thief, John Driscoll, Book One by Thomas O'Callaghan. A sociopathic killer is using the internet to lure seemingly random women to their gruesome deaths in New York City. During his heinous murder spree, this madman is extracting the bones of his victims. His sheer brutality has the residents of the Big Apple in panic mode. Who is this twisted psycho who's abducted a housewife in broad daylight only to dispose of her lifeless body alongside a lake in Prospect Park, nailed the boneless remains of a nameless drifter to the underside of a boardwalk at Rockaway Beach? allowed the gutted corpse of a single parent to wash ashore under the Brooklyn Bridge and has had the audacity to leave the desecrated body of the Magnolia Tea heiress rotting atop trash at one of the city's sanitation dumps. NYPD's top cop, Homicide Commander John W. Driscoll, has never witnessed such savagery. Hammered daily by the district attorney, the mayor, and the police commissioner, the lieutenant who's battling his own inner demons, must use every resource available to put an end to the killings. In a race against time, Driscoll, aided by Sergeant Alagante and Detective Cedric Tomlinson, sets out on a roller coaster of an investigation to first identify the villainous fiend and then put an end to his butchering. Grab Bone Thief by Thomas O'Callaghan 